Oi, every week I sift through the hundreds of brand new papers that come out in AI, and whichever ones have the coolest titles, I grab and I put them in a list for this video. If you'd prefer to read through that list rather than listen to me talk, you can scroll down to this description and check out all these timestamps with links to the papers. During this video though, I'm going to trim that list down even further to the 10 to 15 or so papers that I actually plan to read this week, which you can find over in my weekly newsletter on Substack, also in podcast listenable form. Before we start, remember to like, subscribe, comment, share, all the YouTube things, join the Discord server, follow on Twitter, connect on LinkedIn, support me either through Patreon or YouTube. For as low as $1 per month, you can get early access to my videos, or for a one-time payment, hit my Venmo. And if you'd like to borrow my brain for an hour or two, book a consultation call. All links are over on my link tree. Let's get started. Brain LM, a foundation model for brain activity recordings. Almost 7,000 hours of fMRI recordings. Self-supervised mass prediction training. Fine-tuning and zero-shot inference tasks. Allows for the prediction of clinical variables and future brain states. Zero-shot zero inference. Model identifies functional networks and generates interpretable latent representations of neural activity. Novel prompting technique allowing brain LM to function as an in silico simulator of brain activity responses to perturbations. Brain LM offers a novel framework for the analysis and understanding of large scale brain activity data, serving as a lens through which new data can be more effectively interpreted. I heard about this. Somebody, I think it was um, the that big AI channel, the AI Explain. I think he was saying you could not only fine tune stuff on this, but they could they could possibly like test drugs on it ahead of time somehow, which is wild. We're definitely going to be a adding this to our reading list. Odds I ever get to it, I mean, actually pretty high. I think I would do it, but will I actually understand anything? I don't know, that's not very high, but that will be on the newsletter. MM Ego, towards building egocentric multimodal LLMs. What is egocentric video understanding? Like as in from a first person view of the video, the model has to like answer questions or something? What is that? Yeah, question answer data, data engine, Generates 7 million high quality question answer samples, ranging from 30 seconds to one hour long videos to be asked questions on. Can't say it here. Position ID. LLMs can control lengths, copy and paste with explicit positional awareness. How are you giving them explicit? I assume that means like they can really get down to the token. Like seriously, how are you doing this? Length control is an issue. They don't know how to just say I'm gonna be a certain length of message. New approach is called position ID prompting and position ID fine tuning. Enable LLMs to perform copy and paste operations accurately. I don't know that it didn't explain in there how it's doing it. It looks like just tokens is what it seems like in a, maybe a data set or something. Yeah, this looks like adding in new tokens and just some fine tuning is all it is. Cursor core, assistant, assist programming through aligning anything. I clicked on this because I thought it was out of cursor, like the app, but it doesn't seem like it. New conversational framework comprehensively integrates these information sources, coding, history, current code, program processes, etc. user instructions, collect data to train our models, assistant programming, evaluation, new benchmark. Yeah, whatever. Matt Mamba, a Matryoshka, Matryoshka, sorry, state space model. Uh, I was thinking about doing this, but I was like, I just don't care enough about Mamba. Like it would have been an easy paper. I was thinking like, cause you can just Matryoshka basically anything at this point. Um, and the benefit wise, Mamba's already so efficient, like efficiency gains for sake of efficiency gains. I can't say I care too much. If your efficiency gain allows you to then train a bigger model, like it's a training efficiency gain, then and smarter model, therefore, that's cool. And I, I don't get me wrong. I get there's utility and efficiency gains for inference and everything. And I know we now have this new paradigm of like test time compute, like massive inference and everything, but like just throwing Matryoshka on random stuff is kind of whatever as far as I'm concerned. Like I like the Matryoshka, I think it's a very cool structure, but I can't say that I think it is useful in itself. I think it is a thing to build off of for a much more interesting idea. Yeah, nothing crazy here, it's just a Matt Mamba. Accuracy paradox in RLHF, but better reward models don't yield better language models. Explores whether stronger reward models invariably lead to better language models. Experiments on relevance, factuality, and completeness tasks. Surprising paradox. Language models trained with moderately accurate reward models outperform those 
guided by highly accurate ones, challenges the widely held belief that stronger award models always lead to better language models, opens up new avenues for future research into the key factors driving model performance, and how to choose the most suitable reward models. Why would this be? Is the one that's high, like a better award model actually just overfitting? Is that my guess? That's the best I can think of, right? I don't know. That's my, that's my guess. Just the overfittingness of it and just forcing you down into like really getting too good at teaching the base model to do a specific thing as opposed to just like like showing a light signal and alignment. Maybe. I don't know. The spatial cognition emerge in frontier models. <laughs> okay. Okay. These are my favorite authors. Period. Favorite authors ever. We're, we're, okay, I want to say their full names almost. Out of Apple. Beautiful. Oh my God. The abstract starts with not yet. Just not yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love all of you, even though that makes me not care about this paper as much. And like, it, yeah, like it seems to me like I'm going to read the abstract anyways, because I want to just spend more time praising these authors for putting the answer in two words in the beginning of the abstract. Thank you. Oh my God. Present space, a benchmark that systematically evaluates spatial cognition and frontier models based on cognitive science, evaluates large-scale mapping abilities that are brought to bear when an organism traverses physical environments, smaller-scale reasoning about object shapes and layouts and cognitive infrastructures such as spatial attention and memory. For many tasks, we instantiate parallel presentations via text and images, allowing us to benchmark both language models and large multimodal models. Results suggest that contemporary frontier models fall short on the spatial intelligence of animals, performing near chance level on a number of classic tests on animal cognition. Totally believe this. Not surprising. Love that you have a, a benchmark that's testing both language and multimodal. Love that you were so quick in the abstract. Um, yeah, fantastic. Look, we got all this, all this stuff. Go read this paper. I'm not going to read it, um, but I love these authors already. Just a beautiful abstract. Beautiful, beautiful abstract. Moving on. NLP case study on predicting the before and after of the Ukraine, Russia, and Hamas Israel conflicts. I was mostly just surprised to see these mentioned on archive. And I'm also wondering, what do you mean predicting? And what do you mean after? There's no after. The most still happening right now. Um, I was also very curious to see the, uh, the, the phrasing here. For one thing, putting like the, you could tell someone like what they think about the issue in terms of like how they phrase the issue, right? Like they put Hamas, on the one hand, they put Ukraine and Hamas both first. So you could assume, like assuming that they like, that they are pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia, you might assume they're also pro-Hamas, anti-Israel. But you also might say, well, most people who use the word Hamas or would be like, usually someone would say Palestinian, usually someone would say Palestine usually, right? They would, that's what the phrase you just use, or Gaza, right? But they said Hamas. So it's like these two things that are conflicting as to my signal as to which one they actually are pro in these two combinations of four countries. Um, but if you go far enough left, people will say Hamas and say we'll say they're pro Hamas. So that could be a potential too. And just very um, insight into the author's mindset. I still have no clue what the paper actually is though. What's the paper actually doing? What's it actually saying? I'm not gonna read it, but like I'm just curious as to how this is even coming up in on archive. Method to predict toxicity and other textual attributes through the use of NLP for those events. Data sets from Twitter and Reddit. Notable difference in social media discussion leading up to and following a conflict. Social media scores on platforms like Twitter and Reddit is useful in identifying future conflicts before they arise. Results show through the use of advanced LP techniques, supervised and unsupervised toxicity and other attributes about language before and after a conflict is predictable with a low error. Oh, they're just talking. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Um, that was my rant. MCMOE, mixture compressor for mixture of experts. LLMs gains more. I don't like this. These last three words, those are phrased weirdly. Two critical challenges of the MOE setups, expert parameters lead to considerable memory consumption and loading latency. Current activated expert experts are redundant as many tokens may only require a single expert. Hence why people want to use top P instead of top K for performance, but really for efficiency, you still have to use top K, honestly. Two observations, different experts exhibit varying behavior on activation, reconstruction error, routing scores and activated frequencies, highlighting their differing importance. And not all tokens are equally important. Only a small subset is critical. We propose MCMOE, a training-free mixture compressor for MOE LLMs, which leverages the significance of both experts and tokens to achieve extreme compression. To mitigate storage and loading overheads, we introduce preloading mixed precision quantization, which formulates the adaptive bit width allocation as a linear programming problem, where the objective function balances multi-factors reflecting the importance of each expert. 
develop online dynamic pruning, which identifies the important tokens to retain and dynamically select activated experts for other tokens during inference to optimize efficiency. Integrate static quantization, yada, yada, yada. It's not my thing. Cool. RL, but don't do anything I wouldn't do. I think uh, Stereoplegic sent this, thought it was funny. In RL, if the agent's reward differs from the designer's true utility, even only rarely, the state distribution resulting in the agent's policy can be very bad in theory and in practice. Common countermeasure is KL regularization to a trusted policy, the don't do anything I wouldn't do method. Demonstrate that when this base policy is a Bayesian predictive model of a trusted policy, the KL constraint is no longer reliable for controlling behavior of associated advanced RL agent. Demonstrate this theoretically using yada, yada, yada. Systems today are too weak to exhibit this theorized failure precisely. RL finds you in a language model and find evidence that our formal results are plausibly relevant in practice. Cool, not for me. Rounds and round we go. What makes rotary positional encodings useful? Common belief is that rope is useful because it helps to decay token dependency as relative distance increases. We argue that this is unlikely to be the core reason. Study the internals of a trained Gemma 7 billion model to understand how rope is being used at a mechanical level. Find that Gemma learns to use rope to construct robust positional attention patterns by exploiting the highest frequencies. Also find that in general, Gemma greatly prefers to use the lowest frequencies of rope, which we suspect are used to carry semantic information. Mathematically prove interesting behavior. I don't understand that last part. Mathematically prove interesting behaviors of rope and conduct experiments into verifying our findings, proposing a modifications of rope that fixes some highlighted issues and improves performance. I believe that this work represents an interesting step in better understanding PEs and LLMs. Interesting. I would like to get a better understanding mechanistically of rope for sure. Um, and they do propose a new method, which is kind of whatever, but maybe it's good. Yeah, let's go ahead. And, uh, let's, I'm going to add this one to my weekly newsletter. Let's download this one. From tokens to words on the inner lexicon of LLMs. Present evidence that LLMs engage in an intrinsic detokenization process where subword sequences are combined into coherent word representations. This process takes place primarily within the early and middle layers of the model. This is robust to non-morphemic splits, typos, and perhaps importantly, to out-of-vocabulary words. When feeding the inner representation of such words to the model as input vectors, it can understand them despite never seeing them during training. Oh, interesting. So you just take that like middle-ish layer representation and feed it in as if it's a token at the earliest layer, and it still works just fine. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Maintain a latent vocabulary beyond the tokenizer's scope that you do inside them. That's weird. That's awesome. Provide a practical fine-tuning free application for expanding the vocabulary of pre-trained models. By enabling the addition of new vocabulary words, we reduce the input length and inference iterations, which reduces both space and model latency. Little to no loss in model accuracy. Love this. Very related to stuff I'm doing right now. Very, very cool. Diffusion autoregressive transformer for effective self-supervised time series forecasting. Big challenge in time series is still global versus local dependence. Novel generative self-supervised method called time dart, denoting diffusion autoregressive transformer for time series. Treat time series patches as basic modeling units. Employ a self-attention-based transformer encoder to model the dependence of inner patches, inter patches. Diffusion and denoising mechanism to cache the detail locally. Locality features of intra patch. Design a cross-attention-based denoising decoder. It allows for adjustable optimization difficulty in the self-supervised task. Entire models optimized for autoregressive manner to obtain transferable representations. State-of-the-art fine-tuning performance. Uh, not for me. Everything, everywhere, all at once. LLMs can, in context, learn multiple tasks in superposition. So they can perform multiple computationally distinct ICL tasks simultaneously during a single inference call. Capability we term task, super, task superposition. Phenomenon emerges even if we train model to in context learn one task at a time. Various LLM families and scales. Theoretical explanations. Explore how they internally compose task vectors during superposition. Larger models can solve more ICL tasks in parallel. Further substantiate the perspective of LLMs as superposition of simulators. Interesting. Sounds cool. Doesn't sound super surprising. I don't think I'm going to be reading this one, although it would be cool. Differential transformer. Amplifies attention to the relevant context while canceling noise. Differential technomism calculates attention scores as the difference between two separate softmax attention maps. Subtraction cancels noise promoting the emergence of sparse attention patterns. Interesting. Outperforms transformer in various settings of scaling up model size and training tokens. 
notable advantages in practical applications like long context modeling, key information retrieval, hallucination mitigation, yada, yada, yada. By being less distracted by irrele irrelevant context, diff transformer can mitigate hallucination and question answering and text summarization. Uh, in ICL, it not only enhances accuracy, but it's more robust to order permutation, which was considered as a chronic robustness issue. This is super cool. So they're just taking two different attention mechanisms or attention like, uh, sorry, sequence length by sequence length matrices, I guess, or tensors and matrices and subtracting one by the other in the softmax. Very, very cool. We're going to add this one for sure. LLMs are in-context reinforcement learners. In in-context learning, models are not given gold labels in context, but only their past predictions and rewards show that a naive application of in-context reinforcement learning fails miserably and identify the root cause of another deficiency. Propose an algorithm to address this deficiency, yada, yada, yada. Oh, they're trying to like put a reward value into the context of the previous examples and have it in context learned based off an actual reward value. Eh. Falcon Mamba, first competitive attention free 7 billion language model out of the UAE. First competitive, I'm not seeing uh, actual round the bend improvements though. And don't get me wrong, inference wise, fantastic. Problem is you're still going to have certain tasks, specific tasks that like these models are not going to do very well in because Mamba is Mamba still. And when you say competitive, it's like, it's just not a fair comparison to say that like you're comparing architecture of this one to architecture of Transformer, RWKV, whatever, because you have different data mixtures. I guarantee every time paper, these papers come, every time these papers come out, the, the main thing is like our data mixtures are getting better over time is like, and it's like, okay, well, sure, you can get a second or third place score compared to Transformers as opposed to like an eighth place or something, but like, it's not very impressive when you're comparing against um, Mistral 7B version one, which is so long ago kind of thing. Like, it's not a, not a fair comparison, whatever. Towards a categorical foundation of deep learning, a survey. The field lacks strong theoretical underpinnings and many important achievements stem from ad hoc design choices, which are hard to justify in principle and whose effectiveness often goes unexplained. Research debt is increasing and many papers are found not to be reproducible. This is a thing, there was a paper last week as well that was talking about reproducibility, reproducibility crisis, which you wouldn't expect in the context of code. But like, I guess it also is the case still that like, you know, random seed start from scratch and researcher runs it a few times until they get what they want. You know what I'm saying? This is a survey that covers some recent work attempting to study machine learning categorically. Category theory is a branch of abstract mathematics. It's found successful applications in many fields. It's kind of like meta math in a way. It's, it's kind of weird. I don't, I don't really understand it very well at all. Might be able to give a unifying structure for machine learning, mainly focused on the application of category theory to deep learning. I love this, I, the idea of getting to read this and spending time on it. It would be so, it'd be so damn interesting. So interesting. Um, my issue more so is just focus. And does it like give me a whole ass intro to category learning textbook. It looks like it might actually give a, a good baseline. It looks so interesting. Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to add it to the list and it's never going to get read. Never, ever, ever, most likely. But Locks Architecture, LARC, Efficient, Cost-Effective and Incremental Dataset Architecture for Wikipedia Vision History. This reminds me of an idea I've been thinking about for a while of like the fact that we're currently using individual sequences of data and just training them in batches, all throw them in randomly the data set kind of thing. They're all like not, not related. There is a lot of information being lost in terms of the relationship between different documents, right? Now we're getting better at this. I know the, um, the most recent, I want to say it's deep seek coder, or whatever models. I think they use special tokens to designate breaks between do documents. And then they, in their training sequence, concatenated multiple documents in a row that were the same like relation, like for example, a GitHub repo, like instead of just training, grabbing all the .py files off a of GitHub repo and throwing them into the training data set and like randomly kind of thing and unrelated, they are now like concatenating them back, back to back. Like so you can see them all kind of thing and using special tokens to designate new document, whatever the heck, or like all that stuff. And that makes a lot of sense to me, but I think there's more to it. I really think there's some degree to which like the, the way that our documents have changed over time from like primary sources up to a textbook and et cetera. And over time for hundreds of years, there is information being like, that is not being taken advantage of in there. And I'm hoping this is something related as a topic revision history. So a big part of my idea was like, 
I want to incorporate not just a finished GitHub repo and it's um, all its files and whatever. I want to incorporate like actual change, like Git changes, Git pushes, right? I want to do something along the lines of like cross attending to the, the commitment, commit message or like um, using it as like a prompt or something and finding a way to really uh, take advantage of not just the final document, but like every successive improvement to a given dot pi file like every uh, every git push basically um i think if we can find a way to train such that preferably not just concatenating them all in a row because that's kind of lazy but like to actually like take advantage of the structure somehow that we have in github repos and just in general any area with re revision history um of, of the document that'd be crazy because right now a lot of the um, data being trained on is just finished data that does not reflect the actual reasoning tokens these models have to like should be seeing in order like in order to get smarter um like when i used to work at an economics like expert witness testimony firm like the papers we publish would be the finished version they go through months of revision track changes edits rewrites like what we need is that entire process that data currently does not exist for most domains it does for code because we have um to some degree because we have get push get pushes but like honestly it doesn't because like what we actually want is like the to like let like not just the git pushes the actual final version of each push what we really need is like programmers as they're typing and deleting and reworking like those constant tiny edits that you do every few seconds when working like we need that history as well that's the thing that i really want to figure out how to get at blocks architecture is an efficiency focused data processing architecture that reduces running time computing resource requirements and repeated works in processing wiki revision history data set consists of three parts in infrastructure blocks segments and warehouses uh, build the core data processing pipeline builder modifier transforms the original revision history data set from xml syntax into json lines format for improving the concurrent and storage efficiency modifier takes previously built warehouses to operate well i don't know what this means can scale up easily in both processing wikipedia revision history and incrementally modifying existing data set for downstream NLP use cases, source code documentation example uses publicly available. This, I don't, I don't want to be the person who just organizes the data. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not my thing. But to use it as a data set, if I can figure out an actual model architecture that better takes advantage of this one day, and I will keep this as a data set to one day touch maybe. So let's go ahead and save it. Retalk, replacing or toke. Replacing tokenizer to enhance representation efficiency in large language models. Propose replacing and reinitializing the parameters of the model's input and output layers with the parameters of the or original model. Wait, what? Propose replacing and reinitializing the parameters of the model's input and output layers, which I think means either the first and last transformer layer or the input embedding and output embedding layer with the parameters of the original model, which I think means the random initialization and training these parameters while keeping other parameters fixed. So I, we, what? Okay. We conduct experiments in different LLMs and the results show that our method can maintain performance of the model after replacing the tokenizer. That's the point, replacing the tokenizer. So they, it's the actual tokenizer embedding, unembedding two matrices or shared either way. Um, so it sounds like, mm, it sounds like you can train a model Re d remove the embedding whatever and then get a new tokenizer that's more efficient that's like a, a larger um larger vocab size right and then freeze the freeze the actual model itself and train off this new tokenizer and end up with what effectively effectively amounts to a uh, huge gpu memory savings during training because you can do your initial training the smaller tokenizer and then do your second stage of training, larger tokenizer, and I suppose a uh, larger uh, gradient accumulation stats or something, and end up with a model that is good, I guess. I mean, it's not that surprising that this works. It's not that surprising. Um, it might make sense to expand this into something like, like I would like to see like slowly growing your tokenizer throughout training. I think that'd be interesting of like, start off with like of your bpe whatever like of your 2d6 bytes start off with like just some bytes then like double it every 
10 X percent of the way through training or something until you hit your final 65,000 or whatever, how long, long it is, um, vocabulary length. That'd be very interesting. I think to do that and to make it useful, you'd also have to like maintain the model's ability to keep producing at a given, uh, at a given resolution. You know, like, I, here's what I want to see. Here's what I want to see. I want to see, create your BPE tokenizer. Let's say you have 32,000, whatever it is, tokens, right? Or, and let, let's just simplicity sake, say that you have, um, 1,024 BPE tokens, right? Or 1,020, but minus a couple for, um, your special tokens, start your model training. Maybe just do this all at once, maybe, but I would love to see, uh, using creating special tokens that designate resolution of your tokenizer that say like, Oh, here we're doing just byte level. Like, so it's like, instead of your beginning a sequence token, you have multiple different beginning of sequence tokens that each correspond to a different resolution of, um, tokenization such that you have a byte level BOS token, which always starts before any only byte level encoding. And you have a similar, you have a 512, like twice the size vocab, uh, beginning sequence token. So then you also like of your batch, maybe you have a batch of like 64 or something, then, uh, 2048 is a vocab size. Let's say that then of your 64 batch, 16 of them get trained on token on, on byte level, 16 get trained on 512 tokens, 16 get trained on 1024 and 16 get trained on 2048, or maybe just change your ratio of those. But I think it'd be interesting to think like, does learning patterns at multiple levels help these models potentially get more interesting? Or for one thing, more interesting representations across the board. Second thing, um, uh, more interesting representations for your tokens. That'd be super interesting. I'd love to see something like that. Um, this paper though, I don't think it's worth me reading. Let's move on. Gradient routing, masking gradients to localize computation in neural networks. Training method that isolates capabilities to specific subregions of a neural network. Gradient routing applies data dependence, weighted masks to the gradients during the backpropagation. These masks are supplied by the user in order to configure which parameters are updated by which data points to show that gradient routing can be used to one, learn representations which are partitioned in an interpretable way to enable robust unlearning via ablation of pre-specified network subregion and three achieve scalable oversight of a reinforcement learner by localizing modules responsible for different behaviors. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to if I ever have to do something like this, not for this reason, but like to just to remove the gradient info from certain parts of a network. I might have to learn that at some point, how to do that in PyTorch. P fed game, decentralized federated learning using game theory and dynamic topology works without any centralized server for aggregation and incorporates the problem of vanishing gradients and poor convergence over temporally dynamic topology solution comprises two sequential steps in every federated learning rounds for every participant. First, it selects suitable peers for collaboration, federated learning. Second, it executes a two player constant sum cooperative game to reach convergence by applying an optimal federated learning aggregation strategy experiments perform to assess the performance of PFED game in comparison to existing methods have shown promising results with accuracy higher than 70% for heterogeneous data. Um, I want to, but I'm not going to read. Neuron level sequential editing for large language models, which involves modifying internal knowledge within LLMs continuously through multi-round editing, each incorporating updates or corrections to adjust the model outputs without the need for costly retraining. Existing methods... Uh, typically focus on single round editing and often face significant challenges in sequential model editing, most notably issues of model forgetting and failure. We introduce a new model editing method tailored for supporting sequential model editing. Optimize the target layer's hidden states using the model's original weights to prevent the model failure. Iteratively select neurons in multiple layers for editing based on their activation values to mitigate model forgetting. Whatever. Teaching transformers modular arithmetic at scale. I thought this might be another another Nanda paper. Um, cause I think I saw him open up a repo recently that sounded similar to this, but it was definitely too recent for it to be a paper by him. So that was a silly thing of me. Um, what does that scale mean though? P proposes three changes to the modular addition model training pipeline, more diverse training data and angular embedding and a custom loss function demonstrate success with our approach for N equals 256 and 
Q equals 3000, which is the actual modulo, a case which is interesting for cryptographic applications and a significant increase in N and Q over prior work, whatever. I'm sure this is useful if you want to do stuff with it, but towards linguistically aware and language independent tokenization for large language models. Evaluate the tokenization variability observed across different models. Investigates challenges of linguistic representations and subword tokenization. Underscores importance of fostering linguistically aware development practices, especially for languages that are traditionally under-resourced. Introduces case studies that highlight the real-world implications of tokenization choices, particularly in the context of electronic health record systems. Whatever. Mixture of attentions for speculative decoding. Propose a more grounded architecture for small models by introducing mixture of attentions for speculative decoding. It can be applied in two scenarios, a conventional single device deployment and a novel client server deployment where the small model is hosted on a consumer device and the LLM on a server. In a single device scenario, we demonstrate the state-of-the-art speedups, improving Eagle 2 by 9.5% and its acceptance length by 25%. In a client server setting, our experiments demonstrate state-of-the-art latencies minimal calls to the server for different network conditions, and in the event of a complete disconnection, our approach can maintain higher accuracy compared with other SG methods, whatever. Autoregressive large language models are computationally universal. We've heard this, right? Specifically referring to autoregressive decoding of them, this doesn't necessarily mean they actually will learn a given presentation during training, because they are trained in parallel. Show that they correspond they, uh, to a classical model of computation, which is computationally universal. Show that a universal Turing machine can be simulated with by a lag system. Investigate whether existing language models can simulate this behavior. Give an affirmative answer by showing that single system prompt, a single system prompt can be developed for Gemini 1.5 Pro that drives the model under deterministic greedy decoding to correctly apply each of the 2027 production rules. Conclude that the Church Turing thesis prompted Gemini 1.5 Pro with extended autoregressive greedy decoding is a general purpose computer. Um, a very inefficient one, obviously, but yes, that's a, that's pretty cool. What are the prompt is? Let's check this prompt out. They don't seem to have shared the prompt, at least obviously it's probably in code somewhere. Whatever. I'm going to skip past it. Okay. It seems like we are facing some technical issues. Either my Wi-Fi. No, it can't be that because the live stream is working. Uh, it seems like archive is just being very, very slow today. Interesting. As well as archive wrappers. Well, I found the, file, the paper here. I guess I can do that, I suppose. In context learning and presence of spurious correlations. Conventional approach of training in context learners is susceptible to spurious features. Whatever. Integrating natural language prompting tasks in introductory programming courses. This is interesting. Actually, like the task assignment being craft a sufficient prompt to get the model to give you the right code. That's wild. I assume what they're saying. Yeah, mastering syntax and basic constructs before progressing can be pretty frustrating for novices. I hate syntax. I hate it so much because it shifts the focus away from problem solving, potentially making computing less appealing. Yeah, facts. I cannot wait to be just thinking and not having to worry about memorizing. So they create two prompt focus activities in an intro, in an intro course implemented across four labs in a six week module. First requires students to solve computational problems or writing natural language prompts, emphasizing problem solving over syntax. Second involves students crafting prompts to generate code equivalent to provide fragments to foster an understanding of the relationship between prompts and code. Most of the students in the course have re reported of finding programming difficult to learn, often setting frustrations with syntax and debugging, found that self-reported difficulty with learning programming had a strong inverse relationship with performance on traditional programming assessments, such as tests and projects. Performance of the natural language task was less strongly related to self-reported difficulty, suggesting that they, they may target different skills. Learning how to communicate with AI models is becoming an important skill, and natural language prompting tasks may appeal to a broad range of students. Very cool. Were RNNs all we needed? Probably not. These models were slow due to requiring to backpropagate through time. We show by removing their hidden state dependencies from their input, forget and update gates, LSTMs, removing their hidden state dependencies from their input, forget and update gates. LSTMs and GRUs no longer need backpropagation through time and can be efficiently trained in parallel. Voting on this, we introduce minimal versions of min LSTMs and min GRUs that for one, use significantly fewer parameters than traditional counterparts. Two, are fully parallelizable during training, meaning 175 times faster for a sequence of length 512. And finally, we show that these stripped down, 
stripped down versions of decade old RNNs match the empirical performance of recent sequence models. What does sequence model mean? Oh, it's a Bengio paper. That means it must be good. So they also create a parallel scan type setup in order to make it work just like Mamba and whatnot. So they're simplifying down the equations. Yeah, just dropping some parts. And apparently that fixes the dependence through time. This is runtime and memory footprint. I want to see accuracy comparison against the transformer, but I'm not seeing it. They're just comparing against H3 and S4 and Mamba, which is fine. I wouldn't be surprised if you can find something better that's similar to all those. Yeah, so they just made a much simpler alternative to Mamba, basically. Very cool. Not my thing, but very cool. VPTQ, Extreme Low-Bit Vector Post-Training Quantization for Large Language Models. Due to numerical representation limitations, uh, traditional scalar-based weight quantization struggles to achieve extreme low bit. We use second-order optimization to formulate the LLM vector quantization problem and guide our quantization algorithm design by solving the optimization. Um, further refine the weights using some other optimization. Optimization. All right, this isn't my thing. I don't know why I have it here. Intelligence at the edge of chaos. I believe I may have downloaded this last week. Explore the emergence of intelligent behavior by investigating how the complexity of rule-based systems influence capabilities of models trained to predict these rules. Yeah, I'm very confident I got this last week. Let's get past it. One initialization to rule them all. Fine-tuning via explained variance adaptation. Proposed to enhance LoRa by initializing the new weights in a data-driven manner by computing singular value decomposition on many batches of activation vectors. Initialize LoRa matrices with the obtained right singular vectors and redistribute ranks among all weight matrices to apply, explain the maximal amount of variance, continue the standard LoRa fine-tuning procedure, results in our new method, explained variance adaptation, variety of fine-tuning tasks, faster conversions than competitors, and attains highest average score across multiple tasks per domain. Good for y'all, not for me. MLE Bench, evaluating machine learning agents on machine learning engineering. New OpenAI benchmark they made. Um, let's uh, see, you give it a description of the task, a data set and a leaderboard. The agent has to do all the all the work and output a final CSV file as a submission. Oh, a little glitch in the papers thing. Um, interesting. So they have multiple tiers of the actual uh what they're grading on. Bare minimum does the model even get to making a submission? O1 preview, pretty damn good. Everything else, not acceptable levels of just making a submission. A one preview is 82% submissions are actually valid, like it just functions, I guess. 29% um, of them perform above the median. They have these bronze, silver, and gold standards, which have to do with percentile of results. I feel like uh, OpenAI A1 preview seems to do above chance anyways, it looks like, um, on at least some small percent of these. Still nowhere near solved at all. It's nowhere near good enough to actually do the full thing. Um, my question is... Uh, so I'm guessing like, like GPT 4.0 is allowed to, has the code interpreter thing. It can actually like see the result of its code and debug. O1 preview, at least in the actual app currently cannot. I wonder if it could for this. I'm not sure. Anyways, not going to read it, but cool to see we have this new benchmark. I assume it's open AI. It'll get used pretty frequently. So that's exciting. Think twice. A human-like two-stage conversational agent for emotional response generation. I don't think I cared about this one. I was going to send it to Alan, though, probably. Unification of popular artificial neural network activation functions. Presenting a representation. Some weird functions of fractional calculus. Flexible and compact functional form that is able to interpolate between various activation functions and mitigate common problems in training neural networks, such as vanishing and floating gradients. Presented a gate representation. Extends the scope of fixed shape activation functions. So their adaptive counterparts whose shape can be learned in training data. Whatever is the proposed functional form can also be expressed in terms of those weird functions. Suitable candidate for gradient-based backprop by training multiple neural nets of different complexities on various data sets with different sizes. Demonstrate that adopting a unified gate representation for activation functions offers a promising affordable alternative to individual built-in implementations or of activation functions in conventional machine learning frameworks. Oh, Gokies! Uh, so, yeah, it's just a very general functional form. Is it efficient, though? Yes, yeah, so you could just set any of the parameters in it to recover all of these functions. Mish, sigmoids, swilu, relu, swish, glu, 
you just set the parameters and you end up with that. Um, and I don't see, so they're not learnable though. And if they're not, so they're not learnable. So you, can you even interpret between them? Like, what's the point then if they're not learnable? I thought the whole thing was to be learnable, but it's not, it seems. Like, cool, you have a general functional form, but what does that do? Yeah, I don't see a point when you could just create specialized code that's probably faster, it sounds like. Yeah, whatever. Gokies, though. Hyperconnections. Simply an effective method that can serve as an alternative to residual connections. Approach specifically addresses common drawbacks observed in residual connection variants, such as seesaw effect between gradient vanishing and representation collapse. They allow the network to adjust the strength of connections between features at different depths and dynamically rearrange layers. Experiments focusing on the pre-training of language models, including dense and sparse models. Hyperconnections show significant performance improvements over residual connections. What is hyper? I want to know what it looks like. I should just read it, but I'm not going to for a while. Width connections, depth connections, hyperconnection matrix. Yeah, we'll download. We'll put it in the newsletter. Benign or not benign overfitting in token selection of attention mechanism. Benign overfitting is when nets, uh, neural nets train to fit the training data perfectly, memorize it, but also still maintain a high generalization, generalization performance. Uh, we analyze benign overfitting in the token selection mechanism. The attention architecture, which characterizes success of transformer models, show the ex existence of a benign overfitting solution and explain its mechanism in the attention architecture. Discuss whether the model converges to the solution, raising difficulties, so blah, 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 blah. Not for me. Causal inference with lang large language model, a survey. I don't actually care. Why do we need weight decay in modern deep learning? Remains poorly understood. The role of weight decay in modern deep learning is different from its regularization effects studied in classical learning theory. For over-parameterized deep networks, we show how weight decay modifies the optimization dynamics, enhancing the ever-present implicit regularization of SGD via the loss stabilization mechanism. In contrast, for underparameterized large language models trained with nearly online SGD, we describe how weight decay balances the bias variance trade-off in stochastic optimization, leading to lower training loss. Show that weight decay also prevents sudden loss divergences. For B float 16 mixed precision training, which is crucial for LLM training, unifying perspective from ResNets, whatever. Open Dialoco, uh, an open source framework for globally distributed low communication training. I was talking to a researcher recently who told me that Dialoco seems like the coolest method so far um, for actual dis like decentralized training. This is an open source framework that shares it. Very excited. Reproducible implementation. Hive Mind Library. Training a model across two continents in three countries. 90 to 95% compute utilization. That's pretty damn good. Uh, and I think they hit a 10 billion parameter model in here is my impression. Very, very cool. Definitely downloading this one. Odds we actually get to it, though, in a reasonable time frame are pretty damn low, of course. Navigating digital world as humans do. Universal visual grounding for GUI agents. Current GUI agents use text-based representations like HTML or accessibility trees, which, despite their utility, often introduce noise, incompleteness, and increase computational overhead. We advocate a human-like embodiment for GUI agents that perceive the environment entirely visually to directly take pixel level overall directly take pixel level operations on the GUI. Key is visual grounding models that can accurately map diverse referring expressions of GUI elements to their coordinates in the GUI across different platforms. Simple recipe, which includes web-based synthetic data and slight adaptation of the lava architecture. Surprisingly effective. Good for y'all, not for me. Emerging pixel grounding in large language models without grounding supervision. Grounding ability can in fact emerge in L large multimodal models trained without explicit grounding supervision. Introduce an attend and, seg and segment method, which leverages attention maps from standard LMMs to perform pixel level segmentation. To enhance grounding ability, propose a new method, which is an LMM using a diffusion based visual encoder as opposed to standard clip visual encoder and train with the same weak supervision. Without being constrained by the biases and limited scale of grounding su supervision data, approaches more generalizable and scalable. Repetitive performance, yada yada, not for me. Adam exploits L infinite whatever the hell geometry of lost landscape via coordinate wise adaptivity. Adam's advantage over SGD is not well understood. Argue that the exploitation of nice uh, L infinite geometry is the key advantage of Adam over SGD. New convergence analysis. Losses smooth under that geometry rather than the more common L2 geometry, which yields a much better empirical smoothness constant for GPT-2 and ResNet models. 
confirmed that Adam performs much worse when the favorable elephant geometry is changed while SGD provably remains infected. Yada yada, don't care. I think we're about done. Benign overfitting in single head attention. Prove that under appropriate conditions, model exhibits benign overfitting in a classification setting already after two steps of gradient descent. Conditions with a minimum norm, maximum margin interpolator exhibits benign overfitting. Overfitting behavior depends on the signal to noise ratio, the distribution, whatever. Don't leave yet. If you got this far, you're going to love this video or this playlist. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the YouTube things. Join the Discord server, follow on Twitter, connect on LinkedIn, and consider supporting me monthly either through Patreon or by hitting that YouTube join button down below. For as low as $1 per month, you can get early access to my videos. Or if you're a one-time payment kind of person, hit up my Venmo. And if you want to borrow my brain for a bit, consider booking a paid consultation video call. All of those links are over in my link tree. And uh, yeah, end of video.